Welcome, everybody. This is the May 13th meeting of the IMAG MSM Working Group on Multiscale Modeling and Viral Pandemics. Today, our format is a little bit different. We have Fred Adler talking about his work with the Viral Evolution Subgroup and John Rice talking about the Dissemination Outreach Subgroup and uh, some of the playings they've been doing and then also the, the planning for the big IMAG MSM virtual conference uh, later this year. Uh, as always, the meeting is recorded. Uh, it's being streamed and uh, it will be available publicly later uh, for people who are unable to attend. I'm really pleased to see that we have so many people coming for essentially a more business oriented meeting, although I think we'll learn a lot about what's been going on from that. Uh, the usual slide introducing myself, uh, Reinhardt, uh, Bruce, and Jim, and our email addresses for your comments and suggestions. Our Slack and other sources of information. I think these are particularly important to think about in the context of both uh, the dissemination outreach components of the uh, working group activities and also uh, meeting organization and potentially for the dissemination of the work that Fred has been doing. And the next thing is to call for any short announcements for this week. Is there anything somebody would like to bring up quickly before we move on? No? All right. Uh, the usual reminder that if there is any uh, thing that we should know about how this working group has helped you out, uh, that would be great. Uh, we are trying to document uh, what the working group is doing so that we can make an argument that we're useful. And so any help that you can provide in that area will be appreciated. Uh, next week, we have a single speaker, Rusty Irving from GE. Uh, one of the developers of the digital twin ideas. Uh, and of course, we've talked a lot uh, in various ways about digital twin concepts. Uh, last week, I think in particular, we heard some very digital twinny models. Uh, that will be interesting. Uh, May 27th, we have Philip Ball, a noted science writer, um, and a talk on uh, thrombosis. And you can see the uh, list uh, going forward. Uh, we have quite a few uh, interesting talks coming up. Uh, starting around mid-June, uh, we have plenty of empty slots. And so if you would like to speak uh, or you have suggestions for speakers, please do let us know and we'll do the best, our best to get that onto the agenda. The rules of the meeting don't really apply today because uh, we're not having a meeting of that kind. What I will say is that we will, as I mentioned, uh, switch the order. So instead of our traditional seminar style where we have both seminars and the questions afterwards, uh, people should feel free to, uh, Fred, is it okay if people uh, comment during your talk or do you wanna give the talk first and then take comments? No, definitely please interrupt. Okay, in that case, uh, the gloves are off pretty much. I will try to keep things on time so that both, actually is John on the call? I don't see John on the call yet. So I haven't seen him on yet. Okay, so until John shows up, uh, Fred, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so this is the report from the Viral Evolution subgroup. So I um, signed up to give this talk like a month and a half ago in order to give us a deadline, which worked because we actually have gotten together a few times and put this together. So um, I kind of like to think of the this evolution topic in terms of uh, Daniel Dennett's somewhat annoying book, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, where he talks about evolution being a universal acid that sort of can break everything down. And I, I'm, I see that that thinking evolutionarily, that is what's sort of going on under the hood with this virus, breaks down a lot of uh, so, sort of some of the goals of this group, and I think in a good way to challenge them. So here's the sort of the overview of the topics. I'm only going to say a very brief word about each of these that I think evolution touches on. You know, so <clears throat> the pandemic 
begins with some sort of host switch, which often involves an evolutionary step. Then we've seen a tremendous amount of diversification, which definitely is evolution in the sense of, of increasing genetic diversity. And then there's various forms, uh, this diagram isn't totally coherent, but there's genetic drift, which is diversification that doesn't have direct selective consequences. There's evolution that occurs through interactions of a whole bunch of other stuff, including the host and other pathogens. There's selection itself, and then this sort of dot is leading into where we show up as, as um, you know, intelligent agents trying to deal with this with various control mechanisms, such as treatment. <clears throat> and then, of course, the evolution of, of virulence or how deadly the virus itself is. Okay, so the plan for this is just to, is to sort of mention some issues related to each of these things. And so first is diversification. And of course, identifying the viral source has been challenging. And this is an issue that shows up throughout the evolutionary um, modeling component, which is we have very incomplete data. We don't necessarily have the, the bat or the pangolin who was carrying this virus in the first place. And reconstructing phylogenetic histories has to deal with these many unknowns, population structures, the mutation rates are high, they mess up the genome in various ways that are not necessarily handled by standard phylogenetic methods, recombination, <laughs> which occurs commonly in some viruses, not so commonly in coronaviruses, as far as I know, can really throw off the, our ability to reconstruct the past. And it's certainly a personal frustration for me is that we very rarely can link phylogenetic data or genetic data with patient data to know who got a bad case and you know even how old they were um, and so you know i think multi-scale modeling has really important roles in to being a more in thinking more mechanistically about reconstructing the past of this virus to include things like population structure and you know different forms of selection and perhaps having a role doing some optimization uh, of those methods Okay, so this is sort of the evolution sort of setting the stage for the kind of viral diversity we deal with and using that to reconstruct the past. And here's just one example of a paper that was looking at the UK and I just, I didn't wanna you know, emphasize any of the key points, but there's some issues here that are, they're really sort of non-standard for a lot of phylogenetic reconstruction. There's all these unsampled lineages, which you know, our dotted lines are all over the places. There's importation of cases that start new lineages, and then there are all these lags built into the system before, before you see something just based on either symptoms or just happening not to run into that case. So many of the issues that people deal with in phylogenies, you know, if you're trying to build a phylogeny of birds, you don't have to worry about this kind of stuff because the time scales are much different. Okay, so then this one, in a way, is, is at the heart of what this whole group is about, in my view, interactions. And so, you know, evolution, if it's by selection, occurs through interacting with stuff. And, um, you know, what I've done here at the bottom is, is I just cut and pasted the names of a bunch of the other subgroups, all of which are affected potentially by evolution, because those are the interactions that drive selection on this virus. So what hosts look like, right? Their, their genetics matters, right? Viruses enter cells through biochemistry and at least for other viruses like HIV, we know that, that biochemistry matters. Immune responses differ between people because the immune system is famously di genetically diverse among people, that matters. Everybody's gonna be different. And then the immune system itself evolves through things like affinity maturation, that is making um, antibodies that are more and more supposedly effective and so it evolves on a time scale comparable to or faster than that of the virus. And of course, <clears throat> interactions with other pathogens, and one thinks particularly here of the seasonal coronaviruses, depends on their genetics and those genetics interact with the evolution of the hosts in complicated ways. You know, so here's just five of the subgroups that I had room to put on here that are affected by viral evolution. The immune response, like I've talked about, transport mode of entry are all affected by both the biochemistry and evolution of the virus and that of the host. Replication and release is really the flip side of that. It's another piece of how the biochemistry of the two organisms interact. Modeling individual responses to treatment will depend not only on the treatment, but on the genotype of the virus and of the host. And of course, virus-virus interactions are gonna be highly sensitive to the, to the genotypes of both of the players. 
Drift, I think, is particularly interesting. Um, so, you know, on the on the face of it, you know, drift, which means just generation of genetic variation that does that has no selective impact, is our friend because it's what gives us the information to be able to reconstruct the history of the virus. But it also can lead to challenges for things like testing. So, in fact, yesterday I was talking to the people at, at BioFire here who make tests, and they have assured me that of the million variants out there, their test gets every single one of them. And I actually believe them. And so it's actually, but it's quite a challenge to make tests that have a broad purview like that, but do not, say, detect other coronaviruses accidentally. I think there's some really interesting modeling issues, things that I've never dealt with myself at all, but thinking about how one actually would optimize PCR or antigen testing to deal with this variation, or thinking about um, <clears throat> sort of more biochemical models that can take sequence, actually compute structures, and then sort of computationally tests, test whether different protocols will detect those viruses. Um, and here's a paper that's not about um, <clears throat> coronaviruses by Kennedy and Dwyer. This is, a, is actually in a, in a system in, uh, in, um, in um, um, moths of some sort. And I just so wanted to emphasize that the drift is very much a function of the population structure. And population structure really is a function of uh, transmission itself you know so if my if my initial infection is one virus that starts to grow that has very different effects than if i have 30 viruses in terms of the strength of, of drift so drift is <clears throat> strength is very much linked to the the actual epidemiology now selection is tends to be what we think of as being at the core of of evolution and so viruses can face a whole bunch of competing selection pressures Transmission between hosts is a very different thing from evolution within hosts. Evolution within hosts depends on other viruses that may or may not be around, but certainly most primar primarily on interactions of the immune system. <coughs> Multi-scale modeling tries to interface those inter internal dynamics, what's going on within hosts, with what's going on outside hosts. And once again, using some kind of sequence to structure calculations might help us in order to be able to predict how selection, in fact, will operate in different environments within hosts. Um, Virulence is you know, a central concern. What is going to happen to this thing over the long run? There's this general idea out there, which I think is often the case, that viruses become less virulent. <clears throat> but there's multiple reasons for that. And you know, there's the, the complexity of modeling virulence is, is really quite high. Um, host heterogeneity plays, I think, a very large and sometimes underestimated role in that viruses from their perspective, Jim and I are very, very different biochemical environments, and it's hard for them to evolve to be able to deal with all of those things. And so host heterogeneity matters and affects the evolution of virulence. Treatment itself might promote virulence. If everybody's treated, then the virus might get more nasty. Um, the same idea has been promoted for vaccination, even though I'm fairly skeptical of that. <clears throat> immunity is actually has quite interesting effects on, on, on virulence that is if individuals mount a stronger immune response, the virus may act to be either more or less virulent in response to that. And here's an example. This is a, an archive paper, so we don't necessarily have to believe the results, but this, this is this, this classic idea in the evolution of virulence that there might be a trade-off between transmission and virulence, that is, viruses that are better at transmitting have to build up to higher titers and therefore are going to be more virulent, make people more sick. <clears throat> Again, that's often not necessarily the case. And they um, you know, put some letters and, and made some graphs here, which I'm not going to attempt to explain, but it's basically they're arguing that there is evidence for such a trade-off with SARS-CoV-2. And I, I did not have a chance to study that to see how compelling that is. Um, and, you know, finally, on the control side, and this is, of course, the universal acid thing is, in principle, evolution could erode everything we try, right? It, it could make transmission higher. We've seen examples of that with the British variant. We could see treatment escape, and that was a concern even back in the Regeneron days, which is, I think, why they used two antibodies instead of one, because you can basically compute that it'll be fairly easy for the virus to evade a single antibody. Um, 
modeling how imperfect vaccines can be invaded. Obviously, vaccination has changed the selective landscape vastly, and there is some selection um, to evade vaccines. And finally, how um, developing immunity, that is, if, if we're all hanging around waiting for the second wave of this virus, um, <clears throat> is it going to have to deal with that just as influenza does and change its, itself in some way, either immunologically or in terms of how sick it makes us? Now, um, here's just a, an example of um, evolutionary escape from neutralizing antibodies that people are worried about. And these guys were comparing. Um, sort of different scenarios. If there was a one mutation, two mutations, three mutations, and four mutations, how how many of the the population, how many members of the population will we see getting getting infected by these different types? And once again, I'm not going to attempt to go into detail. Um, so that's it. So that's my grand overview of of sort of how I think viral evolution sort of is related to pretty much everything we're talking about. And there's just a quick summary. So back in the early days of the white papers, Reinhardt sort of laid out a framework, which I thought was really good, of thinking about <clears throat> sort of this topic in terms of four questions, right? What can't we do at this time? I would say right now we can't detect the detailed course of evolution very well, if at all, even statistically. And I, I, that's just in the nature of the beast. There's a huge amount of stochasticity in there um, at, at many levels, mutation, drift, and so I think we just have to be realistic about accepting that. I don't think we really understand trade-offs between levels of selection. That is, if um, you know, are, are, are mutations that make it more transmissible also likely to make it more or less virulent? We don't know that. That's actually extremely difficult to show empirically from the sort of data we have. And I think we really have a lot of problems dealing with heterogeneity among people, that people are really different, not just genetically and immunologically, but also just in terms of overall health status, diet, and all these other things. That heterogeneity may, heterogeneity may matter. We can't address all of that. I'm taking a quick look at the chat here, if you'll excuse me. Right, yeah, I agree. We can somewhat predict the future, but not very well, yes. I agree. Yeah, thanks. I'll never use the words predict and forecast directly. So you can predict that I'll use them wrong. No, forecast that I'll use them wrong. I'm sorry. So, um, so then the second question Reinhard laid out is what capabilities we lack. Um, so I, I think one thing that is to me really exciting is thinking about coupling in sort of in real time, you know, mathematical modeling, informatics of the sort that I was talking about, like reconstructing phylogenies, and ideally some experiments, you know, bringing different um, strains into the lab and doing some, some basic fitness testing to try to map fitness and phenotypic landscape of pathogens as new, as new types emerge. I think that is actually realistic. Um, I think we lack this capability, as I've said, to measure selection pressure very effectively. And, you know, even knowing population sizes, you know, we had that great talk a few weeks ago about how much do they all weigh. That, that, that's very fun, but in some ways what we really care about is the effect of population size from the genetic side. And I don't think we have the capability to estimate that very well because we have to know infectious doses. Um, I don't think, I've tried forecast to see if that's the right word. I don't think we can forecast the fate of new mutants particularly well. Um, so I had some good conversations with some people about the D614G mutation that's been hanging around, or maybe it goes the other way around. And they're still debatable whether or not that was that spread due to selection or due to drift. And the movement of people is, is very complicated and difficult to predict. Um, and then finally, um, this idea that's been thrown around, which I also really like, of model ensemble averaging. So can we actually develop a set of models for these evolutionary scenarios that have some statistical predictability and maybe use real-time data and some sort of ensemble averaging to give us a sense of, of how predictable the future is. So then uh, Reinhardt challenged us to actually do something. How can we develop those capabilities? I don't know the answer and I'm hoping others have, have more specific suggestions. I, there's been a lot of nice work done on certain model systems. I mentioned influenza, HIV, hepatitis C, and, and secular stomatitis virus, which is sort of a lab rat from 
or lab pig. Um, and so a great deal is known about mutational structures and selection structures for those viruses and, and a few others. I think that would be important. And then I had to come up with an acronym. So I proposed the Viral Evolution Evaluation Pipeline, VEEP, to integrate phenotypic and fitness predictions with evolutionary models, right? To try to build on what we know about other viruses to, to, to assimilate the information. And then the sales pitch, you know, why will this be so great? Well, I think we'll be better able to quickly use genetic data and 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 predict or forecast what how worried we should be about different variants and even just know what we should be studying quickly as new variants arise. Do they escape testing? Do they escape vaccination and so forth? Um, I think they'll make us much better able to couple genetic data with with various other kinds of data. You know, I've been ranting for a while that I think the clinical trial design for this pandemic was not done that well. I think looking at it from an evolutionary perspective, that is from the viral diversity perspective, might really help. And then the last point, which is what I already said, is we'll be able to quickly observe um, or respond to emerging genotypes. So I'll go to the chat and just dissect this to the last slide. And so it's much of challenges. Um, so as I said, predicting the long-term evolutionary trajectory, rather important. Um, dealing with big data, in particular, this sort of you know, validation and visualiza visualization of complex data is, is an important issue for all of us to be able to use it. And linking those data with models um, is key. Model integration and reproducibility, as we know, shows up everywhere. <clears throat> this issue that's certainly been on my mind a lot as, as we've worked through these, these questions is setting limits on predictability. I think that'll help us be more realistic about what we can do and uh, realistic about what we can't do. As we know, there's always a great challenge in communicating evolutionary thinking to uh, to the, the general public, you know, here's evolution in your face. It's happening all the time. I think there's great opportunities here, and I hope we can use those to capitalize uh, on this educational opportunity. And then, of course, this a challenge, which I think all of the subgroups have, but I would say that's particularly true of this one, is that evolution affects all processes at all scales. And that therefore, if we believe the Dobjansky quote at the beginning, and nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution, we should accept that as, as sort of being a, an underpinning of what we do throughout the subgroups. That's it. Okay, so that's all I had to say formally. Fabulous. I, I, I guess, did you want to talk more about subgroup organization, or do you want to talk about the science? I always want to talk about science. I don't, I don't ever oh, care about oh, subgroup so, organization. But I guess I could ask a question because, like, that's my privilege, I guess. Uh, which is one of the problems I always have when I think about evolution, and you brought it up. Uh, indirectly and you it may have been solved in your hcv hiv uh examples is that if i want to simulate evolution in a, in a multi-scale model i have to change parameters and in general we what what we do is we say we were going to do some gaussian of width such and such around the current parameter value but there's no reason that a particular single nucleotide substitution in, in, in my, in my drival genome should give me any kind of continuous change in any parameter whatsoever. And so uh, on the other hand, if you think about the effect of evolution of a virus, you might expect that it doesn't matter so much which SNP it is. If the SNP causes a change of parameter of a particular type, then you should have a particular outcome. And so it seems to me there are two very different things, one of which you mentioned, which was going from sequence to phenotypic properties. And the other one was going from variation of subset of phenotypic properties to population evolution. Uh, now, it, again, there's no reason that the, the variation of those phenotypic properties should be Gaussian or even continuous. It could be a total mess. Uh, but Nevertheless, there, there are those two very different questions. And you mentioned, say, using molecular dynamics to do docking. And I can certainly imagine that if, my, if what I want to know is viral affinity to, to my receptor. But it's much harder to come up, although uh, Kevin Jaynes a, a, month, a few months ago talked a little bit about this, uh, 
about the possibility also of say looking doing a model of that type to look at uh, interference with uh, uh, interferon response. Uh, but I want I thought maybe you could try to talk a little bit about what's been successful or un this, uh, unsuccessful in terms of actually looking at what the real distributions of those phenotypically related parameters are and how they map back onto the much easier to do sequence information. In this case, yeah. the single molecule things are easy. You can sequence very easily, but predicting the phenotypic parameters is hard. Yeah, no, I, I agree with all that. I mean, yeah, and I'm certainly not expert enough to answer all of those really interesting points, but you know, certainly people have used the power of laboratory systems and directed mutagenesis to, to map out fitness landscapes, and they do not look like Mount Fuji, that's for sure. Right, they've got you know these neutral networks. There's large flat areas. There's chasms in between them. Um, what the consequences of that are for evolution? I would say, you know, one is it is more unpredictable. In particular, those fitness landscapes are context dependent, and so people can do them in the lab, but that may have very little to do with what happens when they have to deal with interferon. And second, and I, I sort of see this as getting back to this predictability question is how much can we imagine viral evolution looks like good old quantitative genetics, right? You get your cows, you breed them to make more milk and they march up the mountain and make more milk. You know, it really works because those are quantitative traits that, you know, somehow underlying that are many genes of small effect. We know that's not true for viruses, they don't have many genes, right? And so we're looking at more Mendelian-like traits, uh, you know, fewer genes, a large effect. And at least in my view, <clears throat> I'd certainly be happy to be corrected. I think that, that that makes the evolutionary process much more unpredictable because we're waiting for rare events, which are mutations to, to take hold. I mean, I guess somebody pointed out to me, actually it was, it was on the call a couple of weeks ago, that, that until very recently, SARS-CoV-2 still had a lot of ORFs. It wasn't even broken down into genes. Uh, and so uh, that's a, that was a surprise that that took so long. So Fred, this, this was great. There's a, a wonderful summary of the, the key problems, especially the capabilities we need to develop. Uh, and not surprisingly, they're on the modeling side as well as on the data side. Um, can you say a little bit about, about the data side? What, what data we just can't find um, or can't generate and which ones one could? Yeah, once again, I only know my small corner of the world. I mean, you know, the data that you always want to be able to do evolutionary model if modeling is linking genotype with phenotype, right? So we'd like lots of genotypes and lots of phenotypes. You know, a problem that's arisen recently here in Utah, which, you know, Wayne is a good thing, is most of the testing is now antigen testing. So we don't even get genotypes, you know, to build those. I should have put one of those trees, you know, those huge trees that people have made of the entire SARS-CoV-2 lineage. But as I mentioned, very rarely can we link any of that genotypic information with phenotype, how sick did the person get? Young person, old person, male, female, whatever, ACE2 receptor, you know, none of that stuff. And so uh, to me, that's the biggest data gap. And I, I think there's an, almost no way around it unless one went you know, to you know, Korea or somewhere that was willing to really design a study to do that really carefully. I, I don't think the, the somewhat haphazard way that we are collecting data now is gonna have the power to make the genotype phenotype link. Mm -hmm. But won't you also have to have the genotype for the human host as well? That's even worse, exactly. You know, I'd be happy to have their age and the severity of the infection, but that's right. Layered on top of that is this huge variance generator of ge human genotype, which as far as I know, we don't have any real smoking guns for genotype being that human genotype having that big an effect on the course of infection. Hmm. <clears throat> so generally, oftentimes the Veterans Administration tends to have... Uh, the kind of data which, which are usually not so easy to collect. This is an interesting point. So several years ago for my sabbatical, I signed up to work at the VA precisely for this reason, because they have a database of 30 million veterans. But the VA also has the world's most effective bureaucracy. 
And so I never actually managed to get my hands on the data. I didn't try that hard. But I don't know, I don't actually know what's in there. I mean, even people in the group have trouble digging in and getting very detailed phenotypic data on the vets and usually the nasty drug resistant bacteria that they've been studying. But it, it's a good idea. And I actually I'll ask around and see what whether anyone's actually been following COVID in the veteran population. And Jacob. I have a question that's like struck me the minute you said, you said something key that John Weiss keeps on telling me all the time. So it's like, you said that viruses, well, well you can't model what will happen through evolution. You said, because it's too random, those are rare events. However, they do target all sorts of vulnerabilities in our system. Can we model the vulnerabilities we have and then rank them? So saying, okay, this is what we should look after. Instead of like modeling the viruses, model ourselves. Is it something that's useful? I think it's a great idea. I, I mean, that's something that's fascinated for me for years. I honestly don't know if we really know enough about how the human cell works and how it's hijacked by viruses to do that. But yeah, in some ways that... That's my goal to under, for understanding viruses. So I'd be, I'd love to see some good examples of that. Oh, I'm asking because John Weiss keeps repeating this idea to me. Maybe he knows. <laughs> he, we're asking the expert now. You're the expert. <laughs> <laughs> but he, but he has no credibility in this field whatsoever. What kind of experts do we hire? <laughs> other, other questions? Um, I, I have a, I mean, it's, it's sort of half question, half suggestion, but I wonder if, so, you know, if you, if you imagine trying to do a, um, trying to do some kind of, a, well, Jacob was mentioning genetic algorithms. So imagine you do some kind of genetic algorithm that actually goes and tries to, um, and tries to take a sequence and mutate it and derive in some very computationally intensive way something about phenotype, right? And try to map out the landscape like that. That would be, I mean, that, that doesn't sound feasible to me. That sounds like it would require far more computational resources than we have on the planet. Um, could we do this in vitro? I'm thinking of things like uh, Colin Get did with the genetic circuits. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but you know this was this was an idea where okay, this is in synthetic biology, trying to make synthetic genetic circuits that have some sort of a function, right? And the function is usually something terribly simple, like expressing a green protein. Um, and uh, so, taking a bunch of parts, a bunch of you know, a bunch of um, coding sequences and promoters and all these sorts of things, such that they assemble themselves together, mix them together in a big uh, you know, in a big, in a big vat, well, vat or petri dish or, you know, whatever beaker or whatever they did. Um, and then just chose the ones that had the right behavior and then sequenced them and said, oh, here's the answer. Um, that kind of approach maybe for, you know, I mean, I mean, this is, this also sounds terribly dangerous, right? Because if you were to, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if you wanted to say, well, okay, what, what, what sequences are reachable in small evolution, evolutionary steps that um, have higher binding affinity with some, with some sort of a receptor, you might be able to find them in that sort of way by doing the computation actually in the, in the wetware rather than in the, in the, in the, in the computer. Yeah, I mean, it's, it sounds like a suicidal idea to do in your PSL3 <laughs> facility. But yeah, I mean, I, I certainly think if one were to take, you know, so basically a stripped down system, you know, like how does it get into a cell, right? So you have some cell line that expresses ACE2 and Tempris 3 or whatever it's called, yeah. you know, muck around with those things a little bit, maybe just there, the, how much of it there is and then play around with the viral sequence in various ways to see how binding works. We would learn something useful, you know, whether or not that is, would be a crucial component of the evolution of the virus in real life, we don't know. Ah, the airplane. <laughs> Does anybody recognize that image? Oh, yes. That's what it course. means? So this yeah. is from World War II. This is a study yep. of of where a particular aircraft came back to base with bullet holes in it. 
And the interpretation at the time was that we need to make armor everywhere you see one of that red dots, that's where we should be putting armor on the aircraft. And it took them about a year to figure out that that's ass backwards, that the places where you don't see any dots, that's where the plane crashed and didn't make it home. And so we have no data about bullet holes there. So if you put this in an evolutionary omics context, you ask the question, which nucleotides never change or rarely change? The reason they don't change is because if they change, it's a, it's a lethal mutant. So yeah. all of these other places, you know, you can you can do silent mutations, and it makes actually no difference at all in the, in the protein coding. Pro, coding, uh, you can also make conservative changes, which make relatively little, little changes. But there are a few places you, that you cannot tolerate changes. Anyway, just a thought, and it's a cool picture. It's a great picture. No, I mean that's you know that's certainly one of the bread and butter methods in evolutionary biology, right? You look for highly conserved regions, places yep. that don't have bullet holes, and you're like, yeah, you know. And so that's the game of you know trying to find the universal influenza vaccine, or you try to find a highly conserved region that you can target. Um, yeah, and there's all kinds of you know highly conserved and less conserved regions in, in SARS-CoV-2. Um, you know, you know, but I, I think what the interesting point is that those rapidly evolving regions often are the ones that matter because those are the antigenic regions where we see escape from immunity or escape from vaccine. So it's sort of interesting to think about the interplay between rapidly evolving as the stuff can actually conquer us and slowly evolving perhaps targets that we should be aiming at. Yeah, the thought that most antibodies are to surface loops on proteins and surface loops tend to be quite variant without really affecting the function of the protein. As long as they're hydrophilic, they work just fine. And so it's, it's easy to mutate and, and avoid immune response without really changing much in terms of the structure and function of a protein. Exactly. I mean, that's my vague understanding and somebody else can clarify this for me, you know, why a T cell response might be preferable to a B cell response because T cells, particularly, um, you know, ones that use class two MHC are looking at, at proteins that got chopped up inside the cell. So you're looking at peptides that are not necessarily ones that are exposed in any way. And therefore you should have access to these highly conserved regions. I don't know if that's in fact true, but it certainly makes sense to me on logical grounds. Well, that's, that's one of the tricky parts of protein folding though, is that in, indeed the internal parts are not highly conserved. It's, there's a great deal of flexibility of what amino acids pack into the hydrophobic core. And you can get a lot of vari variability in a hydrophobic core. It's almost as bad as the surface. Uh, the things that tend to be conserved are the active sites. They're much less tolerant of changes in uh, amino acid sequence. Uh, but corporate, I mean, you can swap a phenylalanine for a tyrosine, for a tryptophan, for a proline, and it just doesn't make any difference when you're talking about a fold. Uh, the interior core of a protein is not a crystal it's a melt it's basically just hydrophobic goo that's right but it's but for those proteins that have a business end that's only expressed inside the cell as opposed to outside the cell then t cells that's and capable yeah. have access to that where antibodies don't yeah well i think that the other switching from the science to the the bureaucracy I think that was a, a, a beautiful case study in how to organize this kind of analysis. And if we could, if we could have a similar kind of workflow for doing that, that analysis approach for all of the other problems we have, it would be very, very valuable. So Reinhardt, did you have anything you want to add to it? Uh, no, I, I think this is great. And it's a real blueprint for what, what I envisioned the subgroups to do. And, and once that is done, you know, then one can do exactly what what Fred proposed is to to now link together uh, to identify common problems, to identify uh, common solutions, and and work from there. I mean, it's sort of um, you know a, a big evolutionary process, and and it will take some work. But I think if we if we can accomplish it, then we will have, I think, made a great scientific roadmap, but also created a a great uh, uh, connected community of researchers in the different parts. Okay, we can come back to questions for Fred, I think uh, a little later.